about the love of God, we also got to talk about the holiness of God. If you talk about God being a just and a fair God, then we got to find out why are some people saying that God is unfair and God is unjust. Now this question has to do with keeping the law of God. Now the law of God is a law that God gives us to keep. But because of our sinfulness and our corrupt human nature, there's no one in this wide world who can keep that law of God perfectly. So this is why people ask, if we are expected to keep the law of God in its totality and we are unable to do this, then is God fair in expecting us to keep that law? So that's a question we really need to consider at this time. So my sermon doesn't have three points, but two points. That doesn't mean that you're going away early. <laughs> I've used two words. One is the word aptitude, and the other is the word attribute. The first thing I've got to point out here is the aptitude <coughs> of the sovereignly created people. In other words, every human being who is being created is being created by a sovereign God. And all these people who are born into this world are born with a certain aptitude. Now that word aptitude means an inclination. It means a tendency. Uh, a bigger word is the word propensity. In other words, what is our inclination by nature. By nature our inclination is to do that which is wrong. <clears throat> there is no one who is good for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All of us have turned away and we have become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not even one. So our natural inclination is not to do what is good, is not to be spiritual, is not to be God-honoring, but it is to be just the opposite, to be unspiritual, dishonoring God, and disobeying God's word and his will. So anybody who is not a Christian, anybody whose heart has not been regenerated by the Spirit of God, that person will carry on in this normal human way of living a godless, pagan, unbelieving life. And their lifestyle will certainly be not one that the Lord wishes us to have. So God is a God who has created us with this propensity. Now this happened after the fall. <coughs> so when I talk about the aptitude of the people that this sovereign God has created pre-fall, in other words, before the fall in Genesis 3, man is described as being good. And he was created in the image of God and he was created to be immortal. In other words, mortality was not there before Genesis 3 and the fall that is described there. We are told that we were created the image of God and in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 Paul describes what does it mean to be created in the image of God. It is to be created in true righteousness and holiness. Our origin was sinless. After the fall we became sinful. So pre-fall we were sinless, post-fall we are sinful. And sinful makes us unrighteous. When we do something wrong, we're not right. God is a God who is righteous and there is no wrong in Him. So when He first created us and He said it was good, the crown of His creation, Adam and Eve, they were 
sinless. They were immortal. They didn't, they were not created to die. Death came in after the fall and that caused problems in their relationship between each other and in their relationship with God. Now, we're going to deal with this question of original sin and actual sin. In other words, actual sin is what I do day in and day out. Original sin is that what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Now, is God fair in blaming me and blaming you for what our first parents, Adam and Eve, did in the Garden of Eden? That's original sin, and that causes us to do actual sins in, in our lifestyle. In our lifetime. So it's called fair in asking us to bear the brunt of Adam and Eve's fall. Now, if you don't understand the relationship between Adam and Eve and Crosby de Kretzer, then you haven't fully understood the biblical concept of man created in the image of God and God creating for himself a kingdom of priests. He wants people to know and understand him as a sovereign God who loves us despite our fallen condition. It's a very difficult thing to explain, but let me explain it this way. I know, you know that I love cricket. And there was a time that I barracked for Australia. I always barracked for Australia from the time I was a, a youngster. My dad used to go for England. I chose Australia. I don't know why. Watching these cricket matches, Australia cheats, cheats. And they use other words to describe these Australians. I stood up for them and said, no. Australians don't cheat till the paper get what uh, sandpaper scandal, where they were caught blatantly meddling with the ball and tampering with the ball. So I had to admit, yes, they are cheats. Now I can cheat. They cheated, but as an Australian, they say you are cheating, and if I barrack for Australia, you are barracking for a cheating side. Another example, we spend billions of dollars in the infrastructure of Melbourne and sometimes a billion is paid to tear up contract. Now who paid for that? Our government borrowed money and taxpayers have to keep on paying that. Now we didn't make that decision but we are paying for it. That's the connection. We were represented by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were our first parents. We have what is called a representative theology. And Paul takes this up in the book of Romans chapter 5, where it says, just as by one man's sin, sin entered into the world, so by the obedience of one will people be made perfect. In other words, what Adam and Eve did falls upon us and that's why we are born with a polluted nature but through the seed of Adam and Eve through the seed of the woman comes a savior who kept that law perfectly who <coughs> paid the ultimate price and that's why you and I have a link with Jesus who is the seed of the woman talked about in Genesis chapter 3 we face the reality of being mortal, physically, spiritually, and eternally. Now, in Genesis chapter 2, going back to the fall, Adam and Eve were created without sin. They were put in the garden, and God said, Of all the trees in the garden you may eat, but of the tree that is in the midst of the garden you may not eat of it. For the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 2, 17. Now the way the Hebrew is put there is, 
It's a very double emphasis. Dying, you will die. Now God says it very clearly, very blatantly. The day you disobey me and eat of that tree, you will surely die. <coughs> That's what our catechism said. They were created with the ability to choose to obey God. But they were tempted by the devil and they chose to disobey God. And now if God says, if you eat of this tree, you're going to die, and they disobeyed him, and they ate of the tree, obviously, God has to keep his word. And from that time on, death came into his creation. And death in its totally, in its total comprehensive view is physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. They didn't die physically at that particular time, but spiritually they were dead because that spiritual connection between Adam and Eve and God was broken. They knew they had sinned, so they hid. And God came around and says, where are you? Why did they hide? Because they knew they had done something they shouldn't have done. <coughs> did God know where they were? Obviously knew. Their relationship between God and his creation was broken. The image of God in which they were created was marred and scarred. Not destroyed, but marred and scarred. Now we move on to the next section, which is talking about the attributes of the sovereign creator God. The first thing we would like to point out is that God is always righteous. God is always righteous. Sometimes we, we sing that um, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, uh, a God of faithfulness and justice. That's who he is, a God of faithfulness and justice. He's right up good and upright is he. When you talk about a righteous God, it's a God who is faithful to who he is. God is right. The word attribute is a word that we use in English to predicate something <coughs> about the subject. If I say Crosby is short, I attribute shortness to Crosby. If I say Crosby preaches long, I attribute his long-windedness to Crosby. So if I say God is righteous, I predicate the adjective of righteousness to God. He is the subject. And God in his essence is righteous. Good and upright is he. A God of righteousness and holiness. So if God is right and he's upright, he is a God who has to remain true to his word and true to his covenant claim on us. From the very commencement of human history, God had a wonderful plan and that was that he was going to create for himself and make for himself a people. A people. And that's why in Genesis chapter 3, we, we have that curse that God pronounced on his creation. He's speaking to the devil and he says, I'm going to put enmity, I'm going to put animosity between you and the woman. <coughs> and I'm going to put it between your seed and her seed. But out of her seed, there is going to come a person, and the person is in the masculine pronoun. He is going to crush your head, and in the process, you are just going to sting his heel. It is a cryptic, a cryptic message of the coming of the Messiah. From the seed 
of the woman. Why? Because he had to be true to himself when he says, dying you will die. But through the seed of the woman, living you will live. So the promise of the Messiah came way, way, way back in the book of Genesis. And throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament came the story of redemption's history. God is always just. If he's righteous, he's just. He's just because he is righteous, and since he is righteous, he has to be just. You got that? He is just because he is righteous. And since he is righteous, he has to be just. Any judge, we, we say he's got to be fair. He's got to be just. He's got to be right. Of course, human judges fall far short of that. We can't find people who are 100% always just and fair and righteous. Why? Because we are prone to make mistakes. We are prone to be biased. We are prone uh, to take sides. But God is not like that. He's a just God, and because he's just, he is righteous. Now comes a more difficult one. He is just, and hence he has to punish us. Because he's just, if he do something unjust, then this just person has got to take remedial steps to right that wrong. And this is why in Romans chapter 3, we read this. He did it, verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Now I'm using from the King James Version, and I realize that in the, uh, the Bible that we have in our pews, the word just is not used. So my sermon theme is, God is just and the justifier of the unjust. Now there's Crosby, as I stand aside of Christ and outside of Christ, I am unjust. But as soon as by faith I move onto Christ's side, I move from death to life, I move from condemnation to salvation, I move from lifeless to life in Christ Jesus. Now that's the beauty of what we are talking about here today. If God doesn't, didn't punish us for the wrongs we did, then God is not just. And the beautiful thing is that God knew that no human being could pay the penalty that he wanted. Because the penalty in Genesis 3 was, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now the death penalty is what God requires. Now many people don't like the death penalty. But it was God's idea to keep his word. Christ paid the death penalty for you and for me. Why? In order that God will be just and the justifier of the unjust. But there was no one else who was able to pay that price. No one else who was sinless who would pay the price for man's sinfulness. It's like trying to borrow some money from a pauper. If you want some money, if you want a loan, you go to the bank. Or you ask someone who has the wherewithal to give you that loan. But it always comes with an interest. When God paid the penalty in Christ, there was no interest. 
It was a selfless act of love because he was just and the justifier of those who needed to be loved. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but shall have eternal life. That leads me on to the third attribute. God is righteous. He's always righteous. Even when we think he is not righteous. God is just. Always just. Even when you think he is giving me a raw deal. And that's true, isn't it? It's true. When everything is going well, yeah, God is good. God is good. Uh, God be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But when things are going bad, say, Lord, what's happening? Why is this on my plate at the moment? God is merciful. God provides a way. God provided the way for you and me to have hope when things are hopeless in our life. To have life when we are faced with the reality of death. To give us not hopelessness, but hopefulness. Look with me at Romans chapter 3, please. Chapter 3, verse 21. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. But now... A righteousness apart from a legalistic obedience to the law of God. That cannot give us salvation. Apart from that, another way has been opened for us by God. In his mercy. In his mercy. In the Garden of Eden, when they sinned, they knew they were naked. What did God do? What did he do? Eh? He clothed them. They were naked, but God gave them clothes. In Noah's day, God destroyed the people, but he provided them <coughs> an ark. And into that ark, who was went in? Noah and his wife, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives. When God punished Sodom and Gomorrah, in his mercy, he provided a way out for Abraham's nephew, Lot. In the midst of his justice, he shows his mercy. You can't separate the two. You can't play one against the other. They're like two sides of one coin. God is a total composite. He's righteous, he's just, he's merciful. And in his mercy, he has provided a way out for you and for me. Not to be able to, to live life knowing that we have got to pay for our sins. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but God's blood has washed it whiter than snow. That's what God has done for you and for me who cannot pay the price required for us to be reconciled to this awesome God. Without Christ, we stand condemned. But through Christ, we stand justified. Praise the Lord for that. Romans 3, 24. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but thank God, now I can see. By faith alone are you and I saved in Christ. Many religions say you can do it yourself. DIY, do it yourself. The Christian religion says you can't. Don't try, you can't. Jesus paid it all. All to him. 
He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. How inclusive and how exclusive is that faith? In our day and age, it's very hard for us to be so exclusive. Everything got to be inclusive. Don't worry, whatever faith you have, whatever road you travel, it will ultimately get you there. Do good, do the best you could, and ultimately you will be okay. Contrary to scripture. Totally contrary to scripture. If we could be reconciled to the Father by our human efforts, then my friends, Christ died in vain. Christ died in vain. Christ was presented as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that's told us there in verse 25. <coughs> this justification by grace and through faith came by Christ Jesus and our God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Now what does this mean? It is a picture from the Old Testament. The word is the word hilasmos or hilasterion. In other words, that's the word that was used as a, an offering that took away the wrath of God. Now we'll talk about that. That's also foreign to our terminology in this day and age. Wrath, God is an angry God. Yes, when we sin, God gets angry because we are disobeying God. We have broken his commandments. You know what it is when you break a commandment that you have told your children? You get angry, don't you? You punish them. Now we can't even hit them on the back. We can't even give them a tap on the You can't do that. But God says, look, I am angry when you disobey me. And in the Old Testament, once a year on the Day of Atonement, <coughs> the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, that is the most holy place in the tabernacle, separated by the curtain, and he went there with the blood of atonement. He would kill an offering and bring the blood and he would sprinkle it on the cover of the ark. And that was the mercy seat. And that symbolic gesture of sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant was a symbolic way of saying that the blood of the sacrifice was shed to take away the wrath of God. Sometimes when you have your four-wheel drive, you have a bumper bar, don't you? Yeah? Why do you put the bumper there, bar there? To break the impact. To break the impact. This hilasmos, or the sacrifice of atonement, was there in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Christ in the New Testament, as the person who gave his life to appease not the gods, but the God. The word appease comes from the word peace. To pacify, to conciliate. It's the atonement, the at one -ment. Christ is the vehicle through which we are now at one with God again. Because Genesis 3.17, we were separated. Sin separates. Death is separation from God. But by Christ's death, we are now brought back into fellowship with our almighty and majestic God. Praise be to God that we don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it all for us. He <coughs> is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. My last point here, friends, is God's justice and God's mercy were embodied in one body, 
Jesus had come. If we want to see God's justice, you've got to see his love. And this, as I said, is not two entities, not two attributes. They are one attribute of this one God. And if you try to separate them, we are, we are not <coughs> doing justice to God. So if we want to see it in one stroke of sacrificial love, we've got to go to Golgotha. There outstretched on that cross was God's embodiment of love and justice. Embodied in one body, the Lord Jesus Christ. I put it this way. God's love and God's justice kissed each other at Calvary. And that's why Calvary means so much to me. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my guilt rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. Friends, that's what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. Do you know Christ? Bible. We don't need prayer that comes. We don't need prayers. Don't worry. We'll get rid of all this stuff. And when we get rid of all this stuff, we are dishonoring God. We can't do life without the one who created life. We, you can't do life without Recognizing that this life will end one day, sooner rather than later. I don't want any of you to die, please. But you may be traveling home. I may be traveling home today, and I could have an accident. I might lose my life. What's going to happen to me? If that were you, what's going to happen? You have known friends, never had a heart attack. A fitness maniac, get one heart attack, dead. Have you settled accounts with your creator God? Have you had a chance to tell him, Lord, I am a sinner. And I need to know that my sins are forgiven. Do you have peace with your life? Do you have peace in your life right now? Is there anything in your life that has not been settled with God? Secret sins? Public sins? Are you right with God? My friend, my urgency, my prayer, my plea is that you will settle accounts with God today because we never know what tomorrow has for you or for me. Because if your accounts are not paid for by Christ, God, because he's just and because he's righteous, will require it from you one day. And that's the day of judgment. The day of judgment. God has made a provision for us not to be afraid of the judgment day. And that's Christ. He paid the supreme penalty for you and for me by his death. <coughs> In order that at the day of judgment, we don't have to be afraid. Because 
he has <coughs> paid it all for me and for you. Yes, we will be judged. But we'll be acquitted at the judgment. Crosby, I see you through the eyes of Jesus. You are one of mine. You are acquitted. I see you not through the eyes of Jesus because you don't, you haven't accepted Jesus. But Lord, I visited people in prison. Lord, I fed the poor. I was involved in transit. I went to church every day. I was involved in a prayer group. All those doors are locked. Those are all dead end streets. There's only one door that is open, and that's the door of Jesus. He is the way. Go through that open door. And you will find peace. You will find purpose. And you will have the joy of knowing that you are a child of the King. Friend, that's what this church believes. Because that's the teaching of Scripture. That's what I believe. And that's why I'm telling you what I believe. And I can substantiate every word that I've said from the Bible. <clears throat> Friends, take my word for it. You still have hope. You may be 10, you may be 20, you may be 30, you may be 90. Today, you have heard the gospel. Plain and simple. I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Divine redemption is the only hope. And that divine redemption is mine today through Jesus. I can't see him. I can't feel him. But his spirit works in your heart and say, you know what? I've heard this message many times before. But today I feel the spirit of God tugging at my heartstrings and saying, yes. Commit your life to me and live in peace forevermore. No peace in all. K no peace, no Christ. If you don't have Christ, you have no peace. But if you know Christ, you have peace. So he says, give me your heart. Give me your heart. Because I have given my life for you. May God bless you. Give you peace. And may you live forever with the Prince of